In fact, there are three colors of hydrogen. At least there are even many more colors of hydrogen, but there are three colors of hydrogen I will talk about. And green hydrogen is produced from wind or solar electricity. Pink hydrogen is produced by nuclear electricity. And uh, turquoise hydrogen is produced from the pyrolysis of methane. And uh, this is a little less well known. And so this is the, the green hydrogen version of the hydrogen economy. This, these two uh, um, sources of uh, electricity are green. Um, then there is the pink version. So I put here a, a, an image of nu a nuclear power plant. I didn't put the famous refrigerant tower, which is very strange to show this tower with uh, a discussion of emission, because the tower itself is not emitting uh, CO2. It's emitting uh, water vapor. But uh, OK, yeah, so you have the, the reactor here, the compressor, the alternator. OK, so you, you get electricity like this. And uh, well, one of the problems is that I don't see um, how you can make enough nuclear power plants in the entire world to uh, satisfy the needs. Uh, uh, so there is a third way, turquoise hydrogen. So it's very difficult to get a good turquoise color. And then the projector has messed up everything because it's, it's really turquoise on my, on my screen. But here it looks completely blue. OK, so imagine this is a mixture of green and, and blue. Uh, and so you input, this is a, a special type of paralysis, but I will discuss this more later in the, the remainder of the talk. And you, you can directly store it and use it in a fuel cell, but you can also use it in many other ways. So, um, for example, uh, you can replace the traditional steel making uh, process. The steel making is responsible for maybe uh, uh, five percent of the French uh, CO2 emissions because the steel makers like Arcelor uh, produce a very large amount of CO2 in what's what are called the blast furnaces. For the French, ça veut dire au fourneau. Okay, in the in the blast furnaces, you you have a reduction of the iron ore, which is um, um, ferrous oxide, by carbon. So you basically you burn the oxygen in the in the iron ore, and you emit, of course, lots of CO2. And by the way, you also add a little bit of carbon to the steel to do that. Now we replace that by this uh, direct redu reduction furnace. So it, you add some H2, which replaces the carbon, and you produce some water. Then you end up with something that doesn't have enough carbon, but OK, then you have to add it. And you, you then you melt it again in an electric steel furnace, an ESF. And that is, will be Jean Robin's thesis, and Jean arrives next week in the lab to do this with ArcelorMittal. OK, so that's, that's good. Actually, uh, currently, uh, Arcelor is trying to negotiate with EDF to have a cheap and long-term source of uh, nuclear power in the north, near Dunkirk. Uh, maybe uh, some Gadrange nuclear power plant or something. Uh, uh, but there are more exotic uses. So a bit, a bit provocative slide here. How can you still use your Ferrari car? I mean, actually, that's what the Germans have asked that in the European Parliament. They want to roll back the, and, um, uh, the, 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 the end of the thermal car and uh, keep an exemption for German cars that would be powered by so-called clean fuels or e-fuels. And, and of course, Ferrari is an Italian car, so I suppose they, Italians also want an exemption. I mean, they want an exemption for everyone, of course. And so what are e-fuels or clean fuels? Well, if you have a clean source of hydrogen, OK, suppose this, and you have also the ability to remove CO2 directly from the atmosphere. So this is a, a device. Uh, Actually, this, this, this manner of removing CO2 from the atmosphere is already known since 1930. It's 100 years old, but it has never been put in practice, right? You can wonder why. Um, and so you can combine the CO2 you have gotten out of the atmosphere and the hydrogen to make um, gasoline again. OK, so the, the net effect is, is zero. You, you remove the CO2, you, you will re-emit. Um, uh, this, this process of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere is called direct air capture. 
And, uh, is this realistic? Well, one of the things you find out is there's no way to know how much it costs. You look at different sources, and from the same institution goes from $140 to $1,000, approximately. What? Uh, for a ton. A, a, a ton. Sorry, no, it's not a bar. Um, I forgot to put the unit. Yeah, it's for a ton. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, is in, uh, in some news, it's known as the Joe Biden's Green Deal in the US. Uh, it actually has subsidies for all sorts of green things, including a subsidy of $180 per direct air capture. And so it gives you an idea of, uh, of the range of prices. Very rough idea. And, um, and so I, I tried to estimate what it would cost at the pump. So basically, you, if, you, um, if you had uh, the liter of, uh, of gasoline, uh, maybe uh, uh, four euros, which is double of today's price. Well, you could leave one euro for the producer. Yes? Combine the CO2 and so and so on. The problem is that having the energy to recombine the CO2, where does this energy should come from? Yes. It's, uh, it's magic. It's like having a, a toy car with a spring inside, a spring loaded toy car. Mm -hmm. The spring is the CO2, mm -hmm. but afterwards you have to put the energy inside, outside. Where does this energy should come from in this, uh, in this kind of uh, approach? I don't think it's very expensive in terms of energy. Uh, the energy is mostly uh, hydro, uh, uh, the, the pr uh, the, you have to push things from the bottom of these reactors, to push the bubbles at the bottom, so it's uh, more uh, the energy taken to compress and uh, pump the, the things. I don't think it's super expensive in terms of energy for this. This, uh, for, for, to make operate this, you only need 10% of the hydrogen to heat up the thing. Of course, some people want to do with solar, and, uh, but you can do it with the hydrogen you produce. Yeah, but uh, you, because uh, eventually you get the, the energy content of the CH4 you put in. You do not consider that. Mm, you do not consider that. Mm. Yes. Yeah, we don't we don't reconstruct the same fuel, and uh, and uh, uh, CH four is is not the same fuel as the the, 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 the and, and all the gasoline. Uh, but it's it's a valid concern. I I don't uh, I don't think it's the most. Uh, Serious concern because basically this costs hundred dollars per ton. This could cost a thousand dollars per ton. So I, I was rather focusing on the the cost in this case, but it's a valid concern. I I will look it up in my next study. Yes. Of course, you're losing energy. You could use the regular chain. The idea is that uh, the, you change the methane for other energy vectors, say hydrogen the regular, so you don't emit the CO two. So it's uh, the cost you have in the energy still. Mm. At the end of the day, you spend the same amount of energy even more. Even more, yes, you spend more energy, but the, you do it to reduce the emissions. You could imagine producing much more H2 here than you need for this, mm -hmm. and use the H2 to, 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 uh, to pump this and, uh, or heat this up if you need to heat it. Um, okay. So all of this leads to the idea of techno-solutionism. So uh, you see, if you have um, a way of producing hydrogen from, purely from methane, this is a fantastic news for all, all the oil-producing countries. Actually, it's a coincidence, but uh, in fact, uh, Mohammed, who is here, and Sepper, who was here before, are both from Iran. And for Iran, that would be fantastic. Iran could produce tons of methane and then convert it into a hydrogen. It would be a fantastic for all the oil producing countries. In fact, a lot of the research on pyrolysis comes from oil producing countries. And, um, and so the same criticism goes that was expressed at the previous uh, COP conference. Um, well, this is 
uh, a fake solution to the climate problem. I try to think about that a lot, and um, I came to this conclusion. Basically, you have a whole range of solutions. All the solutions are technical in a way. If you say you are going to um, to uh, fire wood instead of uh, gasoline, it's a kind of technical solution. Okay, I have a tree, I burn it, and that's, I don't need a, a gas station. But there is a kind of spectrum from very obvious solutions that have worked already for millions of years, like burning wood, and solutions that are completely crazy and out of range, such as uh, cooling the earth with giant umbrellas, or um, not to say that these solutions are dangerous, but in addition to being dangerous, they are also completely unrealistic. I mean, at, at the present day, we have no idea whether we'll make, make it work. And, and so I would say that um, uh, pyrolysis is somewhere in the middle because we have no prototypes uh, of large-scale prototypes, and direct air capture is, uh, is even more distant because uh, we have not even so much an idea of uh, whether we could upscale the prototype. With direct, with uh, pyrolysis, I think it's not too much of a problem, but for direct air capture, uh, this raises the issue of making very large projects. You know, one of the things we have observed is that it's very hard to make nuclear power plants. In general, it's, large, it's difficult to make very, very large projects. Um, uh, projects that cost more than $10 billion are very large, uh, hard to put in place. So putting in place huge uh, plants that will capture carbon, uh, make clean hydrogen, etc., is it, very difficult. Uh, you can ask, why is it, I'm taking a bit too much time on this, but why is it that uh, you could not create a single coal-fired power plant that captures its CO2? Why? Why? And the, the, this technology has been known since the 1930s. Why is there no coal-fired plant that captures the CO2? Even in Germany, which has a strong green sensibility and has lots of coal plants, no capture of CO2. Well, there was one attempt in the US, uh, in the Western US, the, um, there were subsidies for a, a new, um, a new high technology coal fired power plant with CO2 capture. You know what the cost of that plant was? Say, uh, who thinks it was a billion dollars or less? Two billion dollars. Four billion dollars. Eight billion dollars. Yeah, it was around eight billion dollars, uh, just for pipes. You know, just just for the. I mean, they, and they they had cost overruns. They they they, they under yes. Was it captured by uh, just? Uh, the, the, the that you showed? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly by this picture. Yes, that that was the plan. It was never done because there were cost overruns and then they gave up. Now they are doing things where they're capturing CO two and they capturing it into basalt. They're making stone. Ah, yes. You know uh, I heard a bit about the solid state capture, yes. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so, I think it's, uh, so it's, it's yes. So, you see that there is a problem with making the large projects work. And um, I, I'm not completely sure what the source of the, of the problem is. We can discuss this uh, uh, at a coffee someday. Uh, so now I'm going to the heart of the seminar. I will discuss three fluid dynamical topics: the pyrolysis process I mentioned, electrolysis, and um, a hydrogen tank for aerospace. So this is a, a, a kind of a, um, project by Airbus, where you have the. the tanks here, they have uh, elongated tanks. It works a little bit like the tanks in methane uh, ships, which is beloved by our leader, uh, Pierre-Yves Lagré, uh, who collaborates with GTT. And I think, Mina, you also work on that? No. You don't work with GTT? No. no. Uh, Giuseppe is working. Uh, is Giuseppe here? No. <laughs> OK. Uh, so pyrolysis. So pyrolysis is this reaction. CH4 is split into two. Uh, hydrogen molecules plus solid carbon. Uh, there are two kinds of uh, processes, a non-catalytic process, where you just heat it up and it breaks, 
and a catalytic process where you you use some cat catalyst so lo a lot of metals are a catalytic for this process steel gallium tin and carbon is also autocatalytic so as a result you can make a carbon bed you put, put some carbon rods you push the ch4 through that and the carbon uh, rods uh, have a new carbon deposited on them the problem is at some point it clogs plus um, bush so you have to remove the carbon rods put them back in uh, and the other process is the liquid metal process so this is a view of the liquid metal process you inject ch4 and uh, you have some solid carbon here so you have uh, some kind of device maybe you can scoop the carbon or maybe it just will flow nicely um, and at the top you basically have um, dihydrogen maybe some some remaining uh, CH4 if you look at inside the bubbles the reaction hap happens on the wall and then you deposit this layer of carbon does it cost energy yes it costs energy at 10 percent of the hydrogen should be used to heat it up if you don't have another source of energy such as nuclear or uh, uh, mm, and of course you don't want to heat it with uh, um, by emitting uh, mm, uh, greenhouse gases uh, is something shocking you in this image it's, it's not obvious to see okay this, this produces PAH so you know what the PAH is uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons these are some kind of combustion products so I'm, uh, I don't see any combustionists in the room I, I, you know, I worked a lot on uh, on combustion with Guillaume Legault and um, well I worked I had many conversations I didn't really do uh, in-depth work but and thanks to Guillaume I learned some things there are some combustion products which are extremely dangerous and cancerogenous so this, this is absolutely not a good news but you have you have to notice it um, the this another thing which is shocking is this image I mean this is not not at all correct from the fluid mechanical point of view uh, in a rising bubble you rather have a recirculation like this so you're going to create this uh, this uh, suit here these black particles of carbon they will slowly deposit into a um, porous layer on the on the sides and so this is one of the main processes that we should study to study this kind of process um, of course there's a two-phase hydrodynamics we need to study a bubble in a, in some kind of liquid we have to do some uh, surface reactions uh, study suit formation radiative transfer the suit will block some of the thermal transfers by by radiation so it could be a bit tricky and uh, we also need to study the other types of heat transfer <laughs> so the equations are like this uh, so fluid mechanics diffusion energy or heating or or the, the reaction is actually endothermic it consumes energy uh, radiative heat flux so i worked on that with guillaume legros and raghavendra raman on uh, uh, on uh, radiative transfer so one crazy project is to add uh, radiative transfer to basilisk and actually but someone already did the uh, radiative transfer with uh, with AMR uh, like uh, uh, more 25 years ago but Raga wants to do this in basilisk maybe the difficulties we have narrow regions for reactions so basically it's the same problem as in combustion of uh, Marangoni effects large density ratio metal uh, gas is a very large density ratio large surface tension effects and thin chemical boundary layers but still um, this is a simulation done by Mohammed with the help of Jiyun and we can do one bubble in a molten metal and we get this result which is more or less expected and so it was just from yesterday you see the molten number is super small and uh, the Galileo number here is super large so we're quite happy with that um, electrolysis a second uh, process we can study 
Um, so you have you create these bubbles. One of the problems with electrolysis is the bubbles are too small and they rise too slowly. So the production is very much slowed down by the speed of, of rise of the bubbles. Um, electrolysis, um, well, it happens from nucleation, then growth of the bubble, then detachment of the bubble. It's almost the same process as um, a vapor bubble in nucleate boiling. So uh, you have a, a, a view of that the, in, the, in the vapor bubble. We need to set temperature here. Then we need to set uh, some temperature in the water. We need to uh, study phase change and the hydrodynamics around it. We need some capillary forces, maybe contact lines. Uh, this was all nicely done by Tian Long. Um, so you, you see here the growth of the bubble. This is the temperature in the solid. Um, there are also Shen Bin Chen also did uh, nice uh, similar si simulations uh, uh, in, uh, in at D'Alembert also on a rough surface. Uh, so here the roughness is not interesting for electrolysis perhaps, but it's a nice achievement using the famous contact embed addition to Basilisk by Mathilde Tavares, uh, Christophe Josseron, and uh, Stéphane Popinet. And, um, and that's, uh, that's it for the boiling. Then, of course, you have to apply to electrolysis. So there is a first simulation, which was as this, the one by Mohammed. Uh, it was done almost yesterday or two days before and by Wei Quinn, who is from the Master in Fluid Mechanics. Uh, I don't see Wei, yes, he's here, <laughs> and uh, was helped by Tian Long. So basically you have, uh, here is the electrode, so you have a constant H2 flux on the electrode. Here is the bubble, and of course it's again done by basilisk, and you see the bubble growing. And uh, here you see the production of hydrogen uh, dissolved in water from the electrode, and here you see the gas hydrogen growing uh, by diffusion. And uh, actually, uh, in the group of uh, Detlef Lohse, they think it doesn't happen so simply that there are lots of very small bubbles that are from, they exaggerate a bit the number of small bubbles. Here you cannot see anything, but uh, okay, I, trust me, there are maybe four bubbles here, not a million bubbles like here. But there is an interaction between these small bubbles and the big bubbles, and that complicates things a lot. Uh, and so uh, there is one need for physical understanding why so many small bubbles. And uh, we need to, again, deal a lot with Marangoni effects. They are very important. Um, large density ratios, because hydrogen is a very light molecule. So the, again, the density ratio, as for the liquid metals, is large. And the very thin chemical boundary layers, where we hope to have the help of uh, Jacob, who has uh, done a lot of work on thin boundary layers. And back to Airbus, now to the reservoir. So, this is a, an aircraft of the future, but only for medium distance, no more than two hours. Over two hours, the hydrogen takes too much volume and it's not practical to make a plane running on hydrogen to go to China, for example. So, uh, but well, still we hope to do that. The project uh, involves all these uh, university or university labs, these public labs uh, here, industrial partners, and so, for example, if you take a, a, mm, uh, can you actually, uh, this is okay, but for the next uh, slide, can you turn off the camera because there are confidentiality issues. So, <laughs> uh, so if you do a gentle slosh, that is you sloshing is when you move the tank and the water moves in the tank, it's called balotement in French. Uh, it's, you reduce the pressure very little and here you completely annihilate the pressure by doing a violent slosh. This is complicated thermodynamic effect. And um, so have you turned off the camera? Yes. Okay. So this is a movie produced by my partners in South Africa. It's completely crazy. The, the move, motion of the airplane completely mixes the, the content of the tank, creates a lot of turbulence, uh, reduces the temperature enormously to do the temperature of the uh, the thermodynamic equilibrium temperature of the liquid hydrogen, which is 20 K. And so, of course, you have also the velocity and the density you can look. You, have, you re recover the stratification, but at, at really much lower temperature. It's, it's amazing. I, I don't understand this at all. Um, 
so we would like to use Basilisk to do that and uh, use our phase change models to, to do that. The project starts. Yes? Yes, now you can put the camera back on. And, uh, and so uh, the project will start in 2024. I'm in process of recruiting uh, one or two postdocs to work on that. And uh, yes, um, this is uh, a quite an exciting project. And just from the scientific point of view, have you have seen you have, you have completely crazy turbulence that you observe and heat and mass transfer. So uh, uh, actually, it's a more fundamental project than the paralysis or the electrolysis, I would say. It uh, requires only the existing um, uh, features in Basilisk. So we're quite excited about that. And so you have seen the colors of uh, the transition, green, pink or turquoise and uh, well you can ask me some questions thanks for the talk i uh, didn't get uh, the pressure drop uh, in your um, like uh, third slide, the the the, the, yeah. the yeah. agitation of the uh, like you shake it and then I didn't understand the physics. Well, I, I think what happens is that you um, you you atomize the the liquid hydrogen and it automatically creates small droplets of liquid hydrogen in the gas hydrogen. And um, the, these liquid droplets are injected in the higher temperature hydrogen. They evaporate quickly. The latent heat of evaporation reduces the temperature everywhere, recondenses the hydrogen. And as a result of this recondensation, uh, you, you reduce the, the gas mass and the gas volume. So you, uh, you, you create a pressure drop. The tank operates at 20K? Uh, the liquid in the tank is at 20K. The, the top of the tank is more at 100K. And there's an insulator around it. And it slowly heats. So to me, the prime was not the pressure drop. It's rather the pressure increase. After a while, the pressure should increase. But not, not here. If the pressure increases a lot, if you, you, you would need to release some of the hydrogen, which would be a catastrophe given the the greenhouse gas and potential of hydrogen. Yes? Also, Patrick? In the electrolysis, yes. what is the energy cost and, and the ratio, the efficiency ratio? I mean, uh, uh, I've read that it costs a lot of energy uh, to, to do the electrolysis. Thank you for asking this very good question. The energy cost is Ri squared from Ohm's law. Basically, it's a, con it's a conducting device. You mostly you lose energy by oh Ohm's heating. The, mm, the production of hydrogen is Ki. You immediately see the paradox. If you make I small enough, this will only, always be much smaller than this. So if you produce a hydrogen extremely slowly, the efficiency will be perfect. But you don't. Obviously, the efficiency is said to be around 4%. So why is that? Because if you produce it slowly, it's extremely slow. These bubbles will grow extremely slowly and detach very, very slowly. So you want to have some action. You want to detach some bubbles. You don't want to wait one month to produce a, a liter of hydrogen. Okay. So, so the energy cost is around 20 uh, uh, 20%, is that right? Uh, and, and the reasonable speed. I mean. Well, the, the extra energy cost, the energy wasted in, uh, in ohmic heating is, no, it's more like 95%, because uh, it's, it's a 5% efficiency. Okay. This divided by this is 20, approximately, very approximately. Now, electrolysis is not efficient, at least current versions. Maybe. There will be some improvements. Okay, but doesn't it ruin? Doesn't I mean it, it doesn't ruin it out? Um, it does not what? Such a bad, such a high cost. Mm. Doesn't it? Doesn't it pull the process out? 
Well, it makes it expensive. That's uh, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, <laughs> okay, maybe the questions uh, you wanted to ask is if it, if it's now so inefficient, it rules it out for uh, today practical uh, application. Mm. So is it used actually? Is well, it uh, in, in fact, a lot of hydrogen today is produced by dirty means by using uh, um, chemical mechanisms that uh, emit CO2, for example, uh, using uh, steam heated by hydrocarbons. So can you just uh, list us a few applications where uh, it, uh, hydrogen is uh, needed? Which ah. are the applications today which are dirty? Well, one of the major applications is uh, transportation because you uh, um, you cannot. It is it'd be difficult maybe to use batteries for uh, for large trains or trucks. So hydrogen would be perhaps better for the large trains or trucks. Uh, the the decarbonation of steel in the steel industry. I don't see any other way than hydrogen for the steel in industry. So is it used now? No, it was it was one fact, one plant using hydrogen uh, in the Antillas, in the Caribbean. I think it was Trinidad. It has closed since, but it, it was used in the ten years ago. Thank you for the overview of these uh, scientific problems. I, I have uh, small questions on the first part of your talk. Hmm. You showed some uh, projections or models for the future of, uh, um, I don't remember the, the, I don't remember exactly the number of the slides. Um, so whether pessimistic or optimistic, they all seem to be continuous. Um, have you... Yeah. Yes, I know what you, I think you, you mean uh, this, this slide. slide. The slide before, yes. Oh, you know, this one, yes. Yes. So whether pessimistic or optimistic, have you ever wondered whether there could be discontinuous mm. transitions? Well, uh, uh, if you look at this curve, to me it's rather discontinuous. The tangent. The ten, yeah, the tangent is discontinuous, yes. Um, if you wanted to make it much more discontinuous, you see, even with COVID, where everything stopped, um, you, st you had only a rather small dip. So I, I mean, discontinuity, even if, if it's a small number, it's still a discontinuity, so it depends what you mean. I mean, if, you, if this was vertical, that would be a discontinuity. But it's not a discontinuity of very high power. Yes, and I'm wondering about the models. I mean, do you see that there is space for discontinuity in these models? Because they all seem to be all continuous, continuous models. But complex systems sometimes they show that there are discontinuities. So I would be very surprised if there could not be, or if something actually ruled out discontinuities at a macroscopic scale. Uh, I agree with you. You could have some models to to predict uh, discontinuous events. Uh, but now I must say I must go because I must catch my plane. <laughs> okay. Uh, merci beaucoup.